that exists, Lahul Asma Ul Husna. To him belong the most beautiful names. He is the sovereign, the holy one, the source of peace, the guardian of faith, the preserver of safety, the exalted in might, the irresistible, the supreme, the creator, the evolver, the bestower of forms. And of all the names or attributes used to describe his magnificence, Allah is used most frequently in his revelation. So Muslims refer to their maker in the manner he has taught them. Knowledge is the inheritance which we gain from the prophets. This is the inheritance for the believers. The Prophet ﷺ said that you must seek knowledge. It is obligatory on every Muslim to seek knowledge. What is that knowledge though? Some may use that to justify their taking degrees and degrees and going and going through university, etc., and collecting their degrees, saying, well, the Prophet ﷺ said, seek knowledge, it's obligatory. But what knowledge? This is the question. So the knowledge which the Prophet meant, according to Imam Ghazali, is that knowledge which is obligatory on you. In other words, when you are born, the first thing that the parent teaches the child is la ilaha illallah. There's no God but Allah. The first duty, the human being must know his creator. He must know then his teacher, Muhammad Rasulullah. And all the prophets were teachers, and the last teacher was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the last messenger. Then, when the child grows, of course he must learn how to clean himself. It becomes obligatory to know tahara, how to be clean. He'll get to the stage when he must learn how to pray. So that knowledge becomes obligatory at that time. Obligatory for that child, some say at the age of seven, to learn how to pray. Because the obligation of prayer will come at the age of ten, or the age of puberty. Knowledge of zakah. How many of us here have the knowledge of zakah? Yet it's obligatory. The moment you have come to the age of responsibility, the moment you have wealth, obligatory now is that you know how to spend or how to distribute zakah. This is the obligatory knowledge because without this knowledge, your life has become worthless. It is the knowledge which will take you into the life to come and which will give you the success, the true success. The knowledge of fasting, you must know how to fast. What breaks the fast? What time must you break the fast? How many days is Ramadan? You must have that knowledge when you've come to the age where you must fast. Because this is a duty. Hajj. You must learn Hajj when you are able to go on Hajj. You don't have to learn Hajj now, for instance. But when you are able to go on Hajj, then you must learn the duties of Hajj. According to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islam is built on five pillars. The first, called Shahadatain, is to give witness that there is no deity other than Allah, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his servant and messenger. The second pillar of Islam is Salat, a routine of five daily prayers to be observed at specific times during the day. The third pillar is Zakat, an annual charity minimally calculated at 2.5% of one's accumulated wealth. 
Psalm, or fasting, is the fourth pillar of Islam, requiring one to forego food and worldly desires between dawn and sunset. The fast is observed once a year by able-bodied adult Muslims for 29 or 30 days during the holy month of Ramadan. The final pillar is Hajj, a journey or pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca in Arabia, commemorating the struggle and sacrifice of Prophet Abraham and his family. Hajj is incumbent on all able-bodied adults at least once in their lifetime, provided they can afford the journey. Each of the pillars has been known to demonstrate tremendous powers of transformation in the lives of people. In fact, it was the fifth pillar of Islam that had such a profound effect in the life of Malcolm X. He don't have to worry about us integrating with him. We don't want to be around that old pale thing. Malcolm X was known as a fiery speaker, as a spokesman for the nation of Islam. He had little trust and no affection for white people. He was accused by the press in the U.S. of being a black racist. When the Nation of Islam suspended him for commenting on the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963, a friend urged him to perform the pilgrimage to Mecca. Since I am a Muslim, and I knew that I could never stand up in public and represent Mr. Muhammad anymore, and at the same time I didn't at that time want to say why I couldn't represent him, I knew as his son told me. Uh, Wallace Muhammad, that the only salvation for the Muslims, they would have to turn toward the orthodox religion of Islam. And it was Mr. Muhammad's son, Wallace Muhammad, who encouraged me to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and get myself orient oriented or orientated into the knowledge of the orthodox religion of Islam. Malcolm described his experience in Mecca with these words. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as it is practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all the other prophets of the holy scriptures. For the past week, I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed around me by people of all colors. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans. But we were all participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experience in America had led me to believe never could exist between the white and the non-white. America needs to understand Islam because this is the only religion that erases from its society the race problem. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white. But the white attitude was removed from their minds by the religion of Islam. I have never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together, irrespective of their color. You may be shocked by these words coming from me, but on this pilgrimage, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held and to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. This is a house formed. Eleven years later, Wallace Muhammad inherited the leadership of his father's organization. Never before had so many in America been led to embrace the proper teachings of Islam. Now, last year in college, I was doing an independent study on institutions, all forms of institutions. Aisha K. Mustafa is the editor of Mr. Muhammad's weekly newspaper, The Muslim Journal. My professor, a sociology professor, when I told him what I wanted to do my independent study on, pulled out a book called The Black Muslims by C. Eric Lincoln and asked me would I read this as a part of my independent study. And actually, that was my first direct contact with quote unquote black Muslims as they existed here in the United States. I did not fully agree with the context of the organization, uh, primarily in, in the sense of a representing man in the form of God uh, uh, of, of any color. That somehow did not quite strike a note of a chord with me. But the context of there being an organized, structured group who were willing to work towards improvement of the African-American community did strike with me and that stayed with me. 
يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل O oh mankind, we have created you all out of one pair, a male and a female. We have made you into peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Noblest among you in the eyes of God is the most righteous. Islam is the upward path. If we study actually the word which gives us a clue about this, in Arabic the word for student is talib. Talib. It actually means someone who is seeking. Therefore, part of the transaction, which is education, is that there must be someone who is seeking. I was, I was looking for something fulfilling and something stable and something that I could structure my life by. A lot of people don't like structure, but I'm one who prefer a structured life. And in that search, I found that Al-Islam gives you structure, it gives you direction, it gives you content. And it, it gives you um, what I would like to refer to and what most Muslims refer to as a, as a greater reality. And of course, that reality includes your, the concept of God, a uh, uh, clear, clean-cut concept of a supreme being, being over everything and over all creation. So after a lot of consideration in prayer and a lot of heartache, I left. 1979, I left the religion. And I, I didn't go back. Well, then what happened is I could no longer go to any other religion. Because as a Jehovah's Witness, I was taught that all religions were bad, except Jehovah's Witness. Only Jehovah's Witness gained the approval of God. Everybody else is wrong. So you see, with a clear conscience, I could not go to other religions. And then as a Jehovah's Witness, I no longer believed in their teachings. So I was like a man without a religion. Fortunately, I was not a man without a God. Everybody's faith is, of course, a personal thing. Everybody comes to it in different roles, on different avenues, or in different aspects of life. Um, you, you begin to recognize and compare and actually study. And for me, it, it was that kind of a process. It was a comparison, a studying, or, or, and then there was the recognition that this, in fact, is something that could be satisfying for me. And it was something that, um, an avenue that I hadn't taken before. I even went back to the Catholic Church. I said I was born a Catholic, and I've been a Jehovah's Witness all my life, so I'm going to go back to the Catholic Church. Maybe I missed something. Okay? So I went back to the Catholic Church for about three months, every day. Sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up. You know, I go to all of their masses. It wasn't working. It wasn't working because it didn't appeal here, and it didn't appeal here. You try the church and you try everything else, but uh, there's still that void. And over the 17 years, I've been reaffirmed in this choice over and over again that this is indeed the better choice, the better alternative, and, uh, it, and it will lead to the successes that we were pursuing in life. About five years ago, I had the privilege and the honor of meeting a Muslim person. And I noticed that person because of the personality, always happy, always bubbly, always friendly. This attracted me to that person. So we started talking, the person told me uh, uh, that it was Muslim, she was Muslim, it was a lady, she was Muslim and everything and all of that. Really, I've heard of Muslim, I've heard of them. You have the religion Islam, huh? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. I have no intentions of becoming Muslim. And I said, I'm going to learn how to be a Christian, a good Christian. Not Jehovah's Witness way, but how God wants me to be a Christian. So I began to study the Bible very, very uh, closely at night and, and many hours and in prayer. I read all of the New Testament. I thought I had it all lined up. Then I started on the Old Testament, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Exodus. When I got to the prophets, something happened. When I got to reading in the Bible about the prophets, all of a sudden, I wanted to rest my eyes and I started thinking about that person that told me about Islam, about being a Muslim, about a Quran, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So I said, okay, I am open-minded now. I don't think like a Jehovah's Witness. I'm going to find out if these people are liars, if they are no good or whatever. I'm going to find out for myself. I started thinking 1.2 billion Muslims. Shatan is good, but he's not that good <laughs> to deceive 1.2 billion people. So I'll look at this, this Quran and I'll see what it is. I started reading the Quran. I read it completely all the way through the first time. It was unbelievable. Everything started to fall in place. Everything made sense. I took the Quran and now I could say to my Bible, I know now it all works together. Now I understand. Because of the Quran, I was able to understand my Bible. And I say, oh, this is great. God is making me a good Christian. He's going to teach me through the Quran. Well, as I kept reading and kept reading, I kept reading the Quran more because it made more sense, it was easier, it was simpler. It appealed more to my heart, to my intellect, to my mind. And my Bible, as much as I know that at one time it was a holy wo uh, word of God, now in its polluted state, I started to put it down more. And I started to read the Quran. يا أيها الناس قد جاءكم O mankind, verily there has come to you a convincing proof from your Lord, for we have sent unto you a light that is manifest. Education is the beginning of Islam. As we know, the first revelation which was sent to the Prophet ﷺ was that revelation which began Iqra, read. The order was to read. Uh, people are fascinated about Islam in America. They're worried about it, and they're confused about it, and they're afraid of it in some ways, but they're also enticed by it and intrigued by it. Abdul Hai Moore is a writer and editor in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He was introduced to Islam while running a theater company in Berkeley, California. Uh, the intelligent reader, certainly. And, the, and there's an, uh, a deeper appreciation of, uh, of Islamic culture I think among people, and hopefully as time goes on and there are more uh, writers among the Muslim community who are, who would, who are willing to break out of, say, a mold of pure uh, religious tractism is what I'm calling it, just writing a tract about how great it is to be a Muslim and everyone should be a Muslim, you know, then, then things may happen. I think people will see that there's a sweetness and a, and a, uh, uh, a way of expressing what's in our hearts uh, that everyone would be interested in. I, I think it's really important that um, uh, Muslims start uh, approaching the people as people, and that and that Islam uh, is happens to be our focus, and that it's the um, uh, and that there are in, uh, exciting, enticing, and beautiful things about it that people would be attracted to. I remember in in Santa Barbara. There was a man who was not a Muslim, but he was an intelligent man. He was a writer and a, and a book reviewer. And he, say, he came up to me once and he said, you know, you ought to tell the Protestants about Islam. They would like to know that, for example, uh, it wasn't Eve's fault. <laughs> you know, it wasn't her, that, <laughs> it, 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 that the women are not the ones who are the, the major uh, sinners in, in, in the religion. And on and on, he went through a whole list of things that, that he thought the, the, the Protestants would be very excited to know about. That um, you know that would ch that that is in fact some of the basic teachings of our of Islam. <laughs> Surely, with every difficulty, there is ease. <laughs> with every difficulty, there is ease. Therefore, when you are free from your immediate task, still labor hard. And to your Lord, turn all of your attention. Jihad is an organizing principle in Islam because at every level and at every facet, of Islamic understanding is the notion of struggle. Struggle from within against both what is within and what is without. The initial testimony of faith upon which uh, 
Islamic understandings are built, known as the Shahada, where you state that there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, is an awesome state, very simple but very awesome, because to be able to